Last Sunday, just as we were all gathering here for worship, the New York Times published news of the death of the American physicist Steven Weinberg. Professor Weinberg, you might never have heard of, but he was one of the most accomplished scientists of our age. He wasn't just a winner of the Nobel Prize, but more than that, he was a scholar who wrote books explaining big, complicated ideas in ways that those of us who are not scientists could understand. His best-known book appeared under the title, The First Three Minutes, A Modern View of the Origins of the Universe, which is just what it says it is, a history of the first three minutes of the universe following the creative event of the Big Bang. The obituary in the New York Times describes his accomplishments very plainly. Dr. Weinberg's stature in physics would be hard to overstate. But toward the end of the obituary, it says this. Dr. Weinberg opposed religion, believing that it undermined efforts to seek and discover truth. His view was that there was no cosmic plan, no meaning, no purpose to the universe, just physical forces. The more the universe seems comprehensible, he wrote in the closing lines of his book, the more it also seems pointless. In his study of the forces that bind together the physical universe that were set in place at the moment of its creation, Dr. Weinberg found no traces of any transcendent meaning or intentional purpose. And because he did not find them, he decided they did not exist. I have recounted his story to you because Professor Weinberg is an example in our own day of the question that crowd confronts Jesus with this morning. They demand an answer to this simple question. Why should we believe in you? Let's just remember for a moment what led up to the story we heard today. Jesus has been growing a reputation. People who come to him are getting healed. They're finding hope. They are telling their neighbors and their friends, and pretty soon more and more people are following him around the countryside. Thousands of people are gathering around. They're looking for something to believe in. They are desperate, they are poor, and they are hungry. And what happens? He tells everybody to sit down. He takes a tiny amount of food scrounged from the supplies his disciples had with them. He blesses it, and everybody eats as much as they want. And as soon as that happens, Jesus and his disciples leave separately under the cover of night. The least surprising thing in this whole story is the fact that when those thousands of people wake up again the next morning and see that he is gone, they go chasing after Jesus. They are hungry, and if they listen to him, they get fed. They are hurting, and if they touch him, they get healed. They want more. They're ready to make him a king. They go running after him. And what happens next in the story we heard this morning is a confrontation, a confrontation that happens right now in our own lives every time somebody asks you, why do you go to church? Jesus looks at those people and he knows they're not there because they believe in him. They're there because they got fed. They were hungry, they got food, and now they're hungry again, and so they're back. And they want to know where they can sign up for more bread. What must we do to perform the works of God? That's their question, but what that question means is, tell us what we have to do to get more bread. Jesus and that hungry crowd end up talking past each other because the answer he gives them isn't one they want to hear. His answer is simply this. What you have to do 
is believe. What you have to do is have faith. And what they ask in response to that is, why should we believe in you? What are you going to do to get us to believe in you? How about an endless supply of bread? Hey, remember Moses. Moses fed the people with bread for years and years, and people believed in him. How about you? The crowd of people around Jesus are asking for evidence, just like the physicist. They want proof, just like Professor Weinberg. If all this means something, if you really want us to believe in you, give us something. Now you will see immediately that what those people have in mind is a transaction, bread for belief. How much more true is that in our own day when the meaning of everything is measured in terms of the market? How much more true is that today when the things we make meaning of are material possessions and designer brands and luxury goods, at least to judge by the things that people will stand in line for in Paris, the things that people believe in today are Louis Vuitton and Cartier. What people believe in today isn't a God of love who brings the whole universe into being through love and calls us to be reconciled to each other through love. What people believe in today is Apple and Google and Facebook and Instagram. Those are the things that give them what they're hungry for, prestige and standing and information and influence. It is a transaction. We understand transactions. The people passing by the doors of this place, while we are gathered here inside, this is their question for us. Why should I believe in all of that? What will I get in return? What's in it for me? That is the question we all live with. I can tell you as someone who has been a pastor of more than a few churches, that more often than not, this is a little bit involved in why we come to church too. Here is my child. I want my child to have a good chance at getting into a great college. So please involve my child in a mission project so that they can put it on their resume and have a chance at getting into a good school. Have any of us ever done the same thing? I want to improve my social standing. So I will go to the same church that J.P. Morgan goes to. I want an enriching cultural experience, so I will go to the church with the most beautiful art or the loveliest music. What sign will you give us to believe in you? What do we get out of it? Friends, we should not be disheartened that they ask that question of us because they asked it of Jesus, too. What we believe and what we teach is not really any different from what Jesus taught that crowd around him. We are still saying the same thing and giving the same answer. Our answer is this. We believe not because of what we have received in return. We believe in God because God is God. As Christians, we have a different way of saying this. We believe in God because God is love. And we have known love and known how it changes our lives. We believe because we see the world and the universe and all our lives as something in which we, thank God, are not the whole focal point of meaning. We see this life as being about something greater, something more significant than merely ourselves. And we see everything around us bearing the traces of God's hope for us, God's love for us, the parents who have loved us, the friends who sustain us, the partners who embrace us, the colleagues that challenge us. We don't believe in God because of what we get in return. 
We believe in God because God is God and we are not. Now, of course, there are still hungry people, people who need bread. There are still desperate people, people who yearn for hope and for dignity. And the fact that we believe in God because God is God and not because of what we get in return does not mean we are not called as God's people in this world to feed the hungry and show respect to the downcast. In fact, we do all of that, not because of what we get in return, but because we know it has already been done for us. Because we know that what sustains us in this life of faith is the bread of life that Jesus has given us, bread made through his life, death, resurrection, and ascension. The bread of life is the love that bears our grief and makes our joys, the love that heals our wounds and reconciles us to those that we have wronged. Because we have received that bread, yeah, we feed the hungry and we give hope to the desperate. And when we do that, friends, we show the world how a faith in things beyond evidence, in love that needs no proof, has changed our lives. And we invite others to join in that life with us. Amen.